Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ian Nolson. I'm here with the guys from Simplicity to talk about niche recruitment and getting in between the skills gaps. Um, and we're running a series of these growth surgeries uh, over the next few weeks. Um, I've been in recruitment for about 30 years. Uh, about eight years ago, I set up my own recruitment consultancy uh, called Selling Success. Um, and we work with about 20 to 30 recruitment businesses at any one time across the UK. Um, and I'm an NLP master practitioner. And uh, I have a strong track record of uh, helping recruitment agencies grow their gross profits, their margins, the profitability. And typically our clients are growing at around about 30 to 300% year on year. Um, so what is high growth? So high growth means that the agencies that we work with are growing at at least 20% year on year increase in turnover for three successive years. And as part of our uh, work with these people, um, we've identified through some research we've done alongside uh, Grant Thornton, who did a report on the subject, we've identified that there are seven areas that MDs and directors um, need to focus on uh, to get that, their model and their business right in order to grow them. We call those the seven Ps. And here are the seven Ps. So the purpose, the vision, the people they employ, what's their proposition. Uh, profitability we talked about last time, and you can get that video via the Simplicity website. Um, the productivity and the platform. And today we're going to talk about the playing field, the market in which you as recruitment agencies operate. So in the UK, the recruitment market has become or is becoming polarised. Over the last 10 to 20 years, we've seen the emergence of what we call the managed services, the RPOs, the recruitment process outsourcing, uh, the neutral vendors, that's people like Commensura, Matrix in the public sector and people like GRI in the, uh, under poll in the private sector and a master vendor where one agency might take ownership of recruitment for one employer. Um, in my previous life, um, I worked for Hayes and we did a lot of master vendors for people like RBS, uh, Computer Center, just to name a couple. At the other extreme, we have what is emerging nowadays is called the niche recruiters. So it's, we've seen specialist recruitment companies around for a number of years now, ooh, 20, maybe 30 years even, specializing in IT, accountancy, uh, engineering. Um, and what we're now seeing is increasingly the niches within which, these, within which these people operate are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So rather than just having an agency that just specializes in um, IT, we've now got agencies that specialize in SAP. Or we've got agencies that specialize in Salesforce or cybersecurity. And even to the point where they, we're getting what are called nano niches. That's a, a phrase that was, uh, was coined by um, a friend of mine, uh, Kevin Green, who was the former Director General or CEO of, um, of REC. Uh, and so the traditional recruitment company that operates in most towns and cities across Britain, who were a generalist, who was found on the high street, who were multi-sector, they're being squeezed. And they're being squeezed either this way or they're being squeezed into, into niche. And, it, and the profitability and opportunity and the uh, ways of differentiating themselves are becoming increasingly difficult. I'd even go as far as to say there are very few of these left in major cities where you tend to find them are out in regions or regional towns like Worcester and Gl Gloucester, maybe one or two up in somewhere like Preston or, or up in Clitheroe, but you tend not to find them in Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, London, Bristol and so on. So how do these businesses operate? Well, these guys are the one-stop shop. So if you're, um, if you're next and you've appointed one of these, they manage all your recruitment across uh, the whole uh, skill set. Um, they are very capable of managing uh, large scale volume applications and they usually leverage the effectiveness of these services by um, leveraging the, uh, and exploiting the employer's brand. Um, this side, the niche recruiters, these tend to be much smaller, much more agile, more effective, and they exploit the skill shortages that operate within certain skill sectors. 
and what makes them successful and very profitable is the better ones the high growth ones are very effective at maximizing the um, the fees that they generate and then um, finally you've got the generalist recruiters in the middle these are the one-stop shops locally and they attempt to do both but increasingly it's harder for them to compete on a volume basis against these guys and get the prices right but they don't have the expertise and the knowledge of the nieces to compete against these guys and they're being squeezed and their margins are being reduced and I know from some of the correspondence we've had Vicky um, that <coughs> Some of the people who have written to us about questions <coughs> are currently operating in this space, I think, from what you said. So, <coughs> if move on to the next slide. <coughs> so the niche recruiters exploit the skills gaps, um, and what they do is they operate in places where the demand for the skills significantly outweighs supply. And they tend to find a top rare skill, um, and then they market that skill around to the highest bidder. Uh, the consultants within those agencies tend to work specific vertical markets. So you might have somebody in engineering, for example, uh, looking at avionics. I've got a client of mine in Kent that does avionics, sorry, aerospace and aviation recruitment. And they're even down to the point where they break up the teams and you've got somebody looking after B1 engineers. Uh, you might have somebody looking after flight crews you might have somebody who's just looking at rotary. Um, and they'll build their own candidate networks and the growth of those agencies comes from adding in additional niches or getting or doubling up or putting two or three people operating on the same niche if it's a lucrative one. Um, and at the moment in the UK, and we're going to come and look at that in a minute, um, every industry has skills gaps. So in logistics right now, um, Class 1 HGV drivers, when they run up to Christmas here, um, these guys are in really, and tend to be guys, tend to be in really high demand. Forklift truck drivers, van drivers, believe it or not right now, there's a demand across Britain for just people who can run around uh, small towns, even cities, just delivering parcels for the major logistics companies. Um, and there's a 20 to 30 percent increase in the number of van drivers that are being required at the moment and there are seasonal shortages across the uk if you go into construction uh, the royal chartered institute of surveyors estimated in their recent report that bricklayers is the number one skill that was in demand now that was for the previous quarter in the summer months when it's nice and warm uh, quantity surveyors are the hardest uh, to find technical skill and probably have been now for a good three or four years uh, a 360 driver, uh, those are guys um, that work on building sites, moving stuff around, uh, dumper truck drivers, telehandlers, joiners, scaffolders, all of these skills, at the moment the demand for the skill outweighs supply, although as we move towards the winter months, those that are out working outside, they'll tend to be more of a supply available. Engineering, wow, 71,000 shortfall of engineers for the next 10 years every year that was a figure that I saw come out from Sir James Dyson and they include design engineers bridge engineers safety engineers avionics engineers software engineers and systems engineers people that put the whole of these subsystems within an electronic system a train um, an aircraft a ship who build them and put them all together um, then you've got IT, technology. Um, the number one skill, according to um, Glassdoor, across the whole of the planet right now is data scientists. Uh, they're the hardest thing to find um, with the advent of artificial intelligence, manipulation of data. Um, that's the hardest skill to find on the planet. I mean, I don't know if you know this, we have generated more data in the last three years than we have in the previous history of mankind. That's quite frightening. Hence the reason why we need lots of them. Uh, you won't be surprised if you've had your computer hacked or you've had a virus that cybersecurity is a major skill. I uh, spoke at a conference back in January for um, Cisco and the stat that I remember from one of the speakers is that Cisco get one trillion cyber attacks daily 
to their network across the world. Fortunately, they don't have to have an engineer for every single cyber attack and they can use technology to rebu rebuke them. But that's a phenomenal statistic and it shows you why cybersecurity analysts are one of the hardest skills to find. Then you've got RPA developers who are involved in artificial intelligence and process uh, um, automation. You've got iOS developers, so those of us that have got iPhones, um, apps on your iPhone are developed by iOS developers. Solutions architects, these are guys that build huge computer systems around warehouse logistics integration, maybe around healthcare. And then you've got cloud developers. Everybody now knows about putting stuff in the cloud, the iCloud, uh, Dropbox, I know, Google Docs, whatever you're using. Um, the developers are building systems that sit on the cloud and you can use them over the internet. And then you've got UX and UI designers. So again, all of those are hard to come by skills. Um, in the other sectors, we've got healthcare. Very topical thing at the moment in the news. Currently a shortfall of 11,500 doctors and locums in the UK. Um, the Royal College of Nurses estimate 40,000 shortfall of nurses. There's a shortage of surgeons, midwives, ancillary staff and paediatricians. I mean, education, teachers. There's a shortfall of teaching in, in key stage one, two and three. STEM teachers, that's science, technology, engineering, maths. If you're a maths teacher right now, they're very, very hard to come by. I worked with uh, um, a teaching agency about six, nine months ago, still working with them on and off now. They had no difficulty placing uh, a science or a maths teacher who's willing to travel anywhere on, on a temporary basis. Believe it or not, universities are struggling for lecturers, senior lecturers, principals, and even in the back office, even in the support of the administration of schools, there's a shortage of school business managers who are qualified with diplomas and degrees. So you can see there's quite a large number of skills uh, shortages. So one of the questions we were asked is, how, how do I break into a PSL? Um, how do I get past the managed service operator? Okay, so what you do, what these niche recruiters do, is they use the rare skill to bypass or gain access. Like a Trojan horse, if you remember your Greek mythology, um, this wonderful horse actually exists in Troy, um, and I think it was the Athenians who wanted to break into the city of Troy, and it was a fortified city and they couldn't get inside, so they built this wonderful looking horse, or one like it, um, and they hid inside it a load of soldiers. They parked it outside the gates of Troy. Um, the citizens of Troy thought it was wonderful, thought it was a gift from the gods. They brought it into their city on wheels, and then when they'd all gone to sleep that night, the soldiers inside dropped out and opened the gates, and Helen of Troy, who is the beautiful woman that the, uh, the Greeks were trying to pursue, were able to, so they'd go out and rescue and bring her in. The principle is they used the gift to get inside, and that's what you can do with your niche skill. If you've got a really hard skill that the managed service providers are not very good at recruiting themselves, that they employ themselves can't find and they're hard to come by, then you can use that to gain access, to win exclusive business, to get yourself on a PSL. It's the most effective way. It's a commonly used te uh, um, technique. And I'll be honest with you, I think it's, it's the most uh, efficient and effective way for you as employers and, and, and you as agencies to, to gain access. If all you're offering is the same as everybody else, you're not going to get, get past the, the gatekeepers who manage these. So this is a slide I, I've put together for you um, to try and help understand how a niche recruiter works and how the market works. So we've all for a long time talked about active candidates in the market and passive candidates. There are various estimates in various reports about the sizes of these markets, um, depending on what your industry is, your technology and your geography. Um, this is typically around 65 to 75% of the candidates. This one is typically anywhere between 15 to 20%. For the purposes of this exercise, I'd like to think of them all as quarters and then everybody can, can do the maths on it quite simply. So, an active candidate is a candidate who is 
aggressively looking for work. They're probably registered on a number of job boards. They're probably looking at adverts daily to find the right job. They're probably registered with five or six agencies. And so finding these people is not hard. Sadly, though, they don't represent the top candidates in the particular sector that you're recruiting for. The better calibre candidates have traditionally sat in this, which is called the passives, people who are not looking. Um, and for many years, we used to say, oh, it's about 65, 75% of the UK market. OK. It, more recent studies, and I've seen some studies from uh, Lou Adler in the US and various other people, Greg Savage posts some notes, some uh, um, articles on this, typically recommend that this is around about 25% of the market. These are people who do not want to move. They're quite happy. So if you were to ring them up, Vicky, and say, hi, my name's Vicky. I work for ABC Recruitment Limited. You know, I've got a job. Would you be interested? They'd say, no, I'm very happy. Thank you very much, Vicky. Nice to speak to you. And that's it. These people here, what we call the semi-passes, they're almost the same. If you ring them up and say, hi, my name's Vicky. Uh, I work for ABC Limited. I've got this great job with, you know, down the road. I wonder if you're looking at the moment. And they would say, well, I'm actually not looking. You say, that's a shame because I know you're in IT and this is a job with Google. And at that point, the semi-passives go, well, actually, now that's, that's really interesting. Google, I'm quite interested. And the point is what you've done there is you've leveraged an employer which is considered to be a premium brand and somebody would love to work for Google. So consequently what happens there is they say they're interested. Um, and then this final group, these are the semi-actives. These are what the Americans call toe dippers. So that means they're just dipping their toe in the market. They've probably had a, a disagreement with their boss over something, maybe a quarterly review or their monthly review, and they decided it's raining outside and I'm just going to have a look on Indeed or CV library and they notice a job. So any old advert on a job board will attract these, but these job ads uh, have to be innovative and attractive. They have to be a little bit more inspirational in order to attract these toe dippers. You can also find these people by regenerating people on your database, looking at old candidates that registered with you 18 months, two years ago. You can find these people from getting referrals from your existing candidates using social media, and you can also find them by headhunting. And the same techniques can be used roughly on these people. So you, you asked me a question earlier, I think, Vicky, which uh, around this, didn't you? You were saying... Uh, yeah, so basically, from a Trojan horse perspective, yeah. um, are, are, are the good quality candidates going to be your sort of passive, semi-passive, semi-active, that are going to get you through the door, basically? Yeah. I mean, so the poorer quality candidates do sit here. Uh, and by definition, they've probably progressed from here to round to here. And haven't got a job so or they may have unfortunately for them be made redundant so these tend to be very uh, active and yes you're right the lower caliber candidates tend to be here these people aren't looking to loot to move so if you're a niche recruiter you have to hunt or you have to fish in these ponds to find the people and these are the techniques and these are not easy there's a lot of work involved in this hence the reason why you can demand a premium fee if you're, all you have to do is put a, an advert on a job board and go home tonight and come back tomorrow morning and you've got 20 good candidates. You're not operating in a niche market. It's very easy. I, I'd even go, so we'll talk about the future of, uh, of, of recruitment in a minute and future of work, but I've seen through some of the work I've done with IBM on artificial intelligence that there are, there are literally two, three years away from mainstream, that they actually exist now. There's AI robots that can find candidates using this in this pool. So without being funny, if you're a recruitment agent and your whole business model is predicated on this, you're going to struggle. You really are going to struggle in the next two to three years to make money. You need to gravitate towards finding and using techniques to find people in this space. And, and if I'm honest with you, that it, that is what I do with our, with our clients. We work to help them upskill them to to use these techniques to find the caliber of people here. And then they can justify what they're doing. 
Okay, so the future of work, um, it's a dynamic market. Um, what is, there's lots of conflicting reports around out there. There's literally one a month seems to come out now. Um, what, what is everyone agrees about the next 10 years is that the market is going to be highly dynamic. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of automation, augmentation. So that's when you use technology to su supplement or support an existing worker, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles. So the first autonomous vehicle on the British roads will run this month. Already in Estonia, they have uh, autonomous driverless cars operating in certain networks. 3D printing, that's around. So some of the airlines, believe it or not, use 3D printing, some of their remote airports across the world, to repair or replace a part that's become damaged because it, they can't wait for Lockheed to fly out a particular um, uh, wing bit or whatever. Obviously, it's not the bits that go in the engine because they may not be stressed or able to take stress, but they're already taking place. So these things are going to change the employment pattern, the world of work, and as a result, change what we do as recruiters. There is no cons clear consensus yet, but what is agreed is that jobs uh, will be lost and we're going to break jobs up and new job roles are going to be formed. So when I said earlier about the generalist recruiter, if you're, a, if you're a niche recruiter, you'll see this, you'll spot this, and you'll be able to latch onto this a lot quicker. The RPOs and the MSPs are not going to see it, but they will leverage the brand to attract the new rolled people. It's the generalist in the middle, when this all starts, change starts happening, that unless they've got the fingers on the pulse of every single job family that they work on, they're going to struggle. So it is, a, it is a trend that people need to be aware of. So question it. Yeah. Do you think, just, just being a general public news listener, um, and sort of every couple of weeks or months you hear so-and-so's making a load of run redundancies yeah. or they're setting up in a couple of years to you know, lose however many jobs in 2021, et cetera. Um, do you think a lot of that is to do with a lot of these topics that you're, you're talking um, about? Some of it will be, I think. Um, I think some of it. However, we're going through an economic cycle at the moment, so yeah. some of it will be because people have to displace. Increasingly, though, it will be this sort of change. I mean, I, I think it's probably worth if if, if your um, agency owners want, we can do another talk about this because this is a whole new topic, and it's certainly. If you're in, in, in recruit, if you're running a recruitment industry over the next five years, you need to know what's going to happen, what the trends are, because otherwise you could be, you could have a 20 million or let's say a 10 million pound recruitment business in logistics, and suddenly find out that they're losing or they're getting rid of all of the um, uh, the workers in warehouses, and you've just lost your business. So, so a talk on the future of recruitment. We can look at the future of recruitment and the future of work. So maybe do that in uh, the new year. In the new year. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so we've asked the question, are you? Are you a niche recruiter or a generalist? Because I think what we're trying to say to you is over time, there is a future clearly for these people. It's less certain if you're in this space. How do you differentiate yourself against the commensuras, the GRIs, when you know the skills you're offering are commoditized? Um, just a couple of case studies. So these are companies we've worked with. Um, Alpha Recruitment in Sheffield, they're a construction recruitment company. We started working with them about uh, six, six years ago. The MD at the time uh, employed two staff. They turned over 1.2 million. They were in a rented accommodation. Um, Duncan was responsible for 80% of the business and their average margin was £1.55. Today, the M MD has 10 staff and themselves and they've just recruited a manager. They turn over 7.5 to 8 million. They're in a purpose-built office that the MD owns. Their average margin is up, and the MD doesn't deliver anything. So you can see how we've changed this team from fundamentally a very different business to what it, it was. And some of that has come about. Duncan's guys all work verticals within construction, and, they do, and they're very successful. We can get a trainee recruitment consultant from zero fees to, to an R3 grand a week inside six months. Um, new staff in Chepstow, Simplicity customer, created a, started working with them about two, three years ago, created a 2020 vision for next year. 
introduce new bonus schemes, uh, new websites, social media. They did that with our support customer service. That was quite key. In, and they launched a driver division. And the MD is now taking more of a strategic role. Again, they've got a manager. Their revenues have doubled in two years. And the gross profit is up 35% year on year. So a very, very successful business that now, again, we've transformed some of the, using some of the techniques we've talked about today and last time. Um, so just finally, um, in the new year, if, if anyone's interested, we're running a, um, a, a series of workshops. There are uh, three two-day workshops with presentations and, and diagnostic and learning opportunities. Um, throughout the year, there'll be coaching sessions that are diagnostic to an out, help you identify what are the inhibitors to your growth. And there'll be some personal one-to-one -one coaching. If you're interested in the program, please talk to your account manager. Um, I know the guys at Simplicity are interested in encouraging some of their guys to go on this. And the, uh, there may be some financial benefit as well to both you and Simplicity. So, you know, come back to us. Um, and other than that, any questions, guys, just drop them into Vicky and the marketing team here at Simplicity. And I think we're back again in the new year or we got one more before Christmas? No, new year. We're going to talk about... Uh, Top sectors, sectors for, for recruitment. Growth. And then we've also got one on Brexit as well. One on Brexit, the big B subject. <clears throat> and, that, and then hopefully, by the time we get to Christmas, we'll have an idea what Brexit may or may not look like. But then we may not. Who knows? Thanks so much. We look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheers.